beautiful day outside. Let's just go out in the courtyard and do, do this. It's just so nice outside. You know, let me ask you to do something one more time, just to stand with me if you would. And we're going to pray before we get into the scriptures, Nehemiah chapter 13. Lord, we thank you for your word. May it wash and renew our minds. May it challenge us to be who you've called us to be. Lord, may it exhort us, encourage us, strengthen us, and feed us today. Lord, we thank you for giving us this bread to eat that feeds our spiritual man and woman. Thank you for time to gather in it and the freedom to open it and shake share it in a public way. Help us never take that for granted. Bless this time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grab a seat if you would. We've, we've all heard stories that have this ending, and they lived happily ever after. Well, that might be the way Nehemiah would end if we ended last week in chapter 12. But chapter 13 is a different story. In the last chapter, the, the closing story, well, it's, it's one of disobedience. It's one of compromise. It's one of tension. Uh, Nehemiah had gone back to Persia. He had gone back to his original position there and had left the city of Jerusalem, had left Israel, and while the cat's away, you guys don't know that, that one? The what? Thought I was the only old guy here. I mean, out of sight, out of mind, what Nehemiah doesn't know won't hurt him. So chapter 13 does not end very happily ever after. In fact, in chapter 10, the Israelites had taken a vow. They had vowed to the Lord that they would not intermarry with other races. They would not allow the Moabites and the Ammonites to intermingle with their people. They wouldn't embrace the false gods or practices of the Ammonites are the Moabites, that they had made this very strong kind of commitment to the Lord. And as we step into chapter 13, it says, on that day, verse 1, they read from the book of Moses. This is when they made that vow and in the hearing of the people, and it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly of God. Why? Because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam, a prophet, against them to curse them. However, and this is a great verse, our God turned the curse into a blessing. And God can do that in your lives. So it was when they had heard the law that they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. Now, you might stop right there and say, wow, major racial discrimination. I mean, total bigots, these Israelites. What's wrong with an Ammonite or a Moabite? I, I, I mean, Ammonite lives matter, right? So do Moabite lives. What's the deal? Were they pro-Biden? Were they pro-Trumpers? Are they Democrats, Republicans? Did they destroy the bridge? What is with these Moabites and Ammonites? Well, here's the situation. When the Israelites left Egypt, and they made their way, and they finally get to the edge of the Promised Land, as was said here, they, they were not treated with hospitality. They were not welcomed by the Moabites or the Ammonites. In fact, they, they hired Balaam, the prophet, to to come and curse them. You, you remember that story from the book of Norm, uh, Numbers? Balaam, the prophet, is hired, and he's going to curse his own people, and he's making his way there, and he's riding a donkey. 
and the donkey is making its way through the trail to go curse them with, with Balaam on his back, and suddenly the donkey sees an angel, but Balaam doesn't. And the donkey sits down, and Balaam's angry. He's, he's beating the donkey with a stick. And, and the most amazing thing occurs, the donkey turns around and talks to him. And he says, why are you beating me? Have I not been a you know, good servant to you? And I was going to show a little clip of Shrek and the donkey, but, you know, it just <laughs> didn't work out. And... But they, they finally see the, 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 the situation there is that Balaam finally sees the angel himself. And here's part of the problem of this story. This issue of not welcoming the Israelites into the promised land by the Ammonites and the Moabites, that was 900 years before this time. And you, and you stop, and, you, and I know this is kind of a history lesson, but it's part of the background we need to know. It's been 900 years since Balaam and the donkey and the Ammonites and the Moabites had done this. You might say, man, God doesn't, he keeps a grudge. What's the deal? Is he still upset? Well, well, they continue to deal with this problem with the Moabites and the Ammonites up to this time. In fact, in Ezra chapter 9, I'm going to throw a couple of verses. This is during the same time they said this about them. What shall we say after this when they were intermingling with these people? We've forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, the land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land with the uncleanliness of the peoples of the land. He's talking about the Moabites and Ammonites with their abominations, which said they have filled it from one end to another with their impurity. So this is going on still. And what is going on with this is God is trying to keep the Israelites and giving to us right now a warning. It, 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 the Old Testament is a shadow, if you will, a picture of things to come. And this picture is with the Ammonites and the Moabites. It's an outer expression of an inward problem, an inward issue. It's not about race, really. It's not about ethnic issues. It's about compromise. It's about impurity. It's about lifestyle. It's about obedience. See, I don't know how far you want to go back with the Ammonites and the Moabites. But it goes beyond when the Israelites came up to the borders of the Promised Land. It goes all the way back to Genesis, all the way back to Abraham. Abraham sets out, God calls him to you know, go to a place, to a land that he'll take him to. And he takes his nephew Lot, and you know the story how they got so large with their crops and their fields and their shepherds that they had to separate from one another. And Lot chose to settle eventually in Sodom and Gomorrah. And it becomes a place where he's impacted by wickedness, where his children are impacted by it. And God decides to destroy that place. You know the story. Lot escapes with his daughters. His wife looks back. They make their way to hide in the cave, and they're, they're watching the, the, the world, they, in their eyes, really burning up. And so the daughters have this idea. And part of this comes from being so engrossed in a wicked culture that they decide, in order to carry on the name of the family, these two daughters, Lot's daughters, to get their father drunk. Yeah, this is a little PG-13. This is a little soap opera-ish, so hang in there with me. They get their father drunk, and the two daughters of Lot have sexual relationship with him. And they have two sons. They both conceive, one named Ammon and the other named Moab. And these 
are the founders of these two tribes. And, and God has, has been dealing with this group of people. Their impurity, their seduction, uh, their harassment, and, and their undermining of his people from this time, from the time of Abraham. It, it's a picture for us. I mean, in the New Testament, we have boundaries drawn like, like God will tell believers, hey, don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Like when you come to marry or you come to, to, you know, join yourself together with another person in God's eyes. He's pretty clear about that. He says, hey, don't, don't marry an unbeliever. What does light have to do with darkness? It, and, and I've been involved with lots of couples over the years. And, you know, they come in, we'll sit down, we'll talk. And, and it's obvious that maybe one's not a believer and you try to raise that issue. And they're like, oh, no, 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 we're good. You all understand what missionary dating is? Have you heard that term? Oh, I'm going to change him. Yeah, sure you are. How many of you know, well, I'm not going to even go there. And and they'll tell you all kinds of things. And you say, you know, it's really, here it is in Scripture. And they'll go away and say, I don't like talking to that guy. He makes me feel guilty. I'm just telling you what, but we both like pizza. We both love to walk on the beach and sunsets. The Ammonites and the Moabites from the time of Abraham had seduced, harassed, and undermined God's people. And listen, you and I have an enemy. You and I have a strong enemy. And it's called the flesh. Do you ever deal with it? That inner self, that inner conflict. I, I looked in the mirror this morning and I was staring at the biggest problem in my life, me. And that's it, my flesh. Your flesh is like a, a spoiled two-year-old. You ever dealt with a spoiled two-year-old? Everything you try to get them to do, they know and they cry, and if they're grouchy, and, and if they were bigger, they'd tear you limb from limb. <laughs> that's the flesh. It wants its way, it's got attitudes, it it has this sense of entitlement, it needs to be first. See, this is part of the spiritual application of Nehemiah, that there's an enemy that's constantly trying to undermine and bring impurity and to, to get you to compromise. Nehemiah had left. And the people began to drift back into their old life. In verse 4, now, before this, Eliashib, the priest having authority over the storerooms of the house of our God, was allied with Tobiah. Now, you're you're going to have to dig in a little bit to get this story. And he was prepared, he had prepared for him a large room. With the high priestess doing this for Tobiah, who's connected to the Ammonites and the Moabites, And he prepared for him a large room where previously they had stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tithes of grain, the new wine, the oil, which were commanded to be given to the Levites and singers and gatekeepers and the offerings for the priests. This is an interesting deal. But during all this, this is Nehemiah. I wasn't in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I returned to the king. Then after certain days... I got leave. No one knows how long he was really gone. Something one to two years. And I came to Jerusalem, verse 7, and discovered the evil that Elisha had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. If you get the picture, he's kind of kicked the Levites out of their storage area for all the grain and what had been given to them for tithes because they served the temple. And he moved this Tobiah guy in. He said, it grieves me bitterly, therefore I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. I commanded them to cleanse the rooms. I brought back into the articles of the house of God, the grain, the frankincense. I also realized that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them for each of the Levites and singers who did the work. Well, they had to go back into the field. They're out working the fields instead of ministering in the temple. So I contended with the rulers. And I said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered him together, and I set them in their place. And then all Judah 
brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine, the oil, to the storehouse. Now, the high priest had allowed his grandson. Here's the background. This high priest, who, who, whose name is Elishab, had allowed his grandson to marry into the Ammonite family, which was strictly forbidden. He married the daughter of Sanballat, the governor of Samaria, one of the ones who opposed Nehemiah when he first came to rebuild the walls. He and Tobiah had come against Nehemiah. In, in chapter 4, in verse 1, it, you see the beginning. It so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant, and he mocked the Jews. And it goes on how he spoke before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifice? Will they complete it in the day? He basically just harassed them. And then in verse 3, it says, now Tobiah, the Ammonite, was beside him. And he said, whatever they build, in other words, it's weak, it's feeble. Even if a fox goes on it, he'll break down the stone wall. Now... Tobiah's living in the temple and kicked out the resources for the priest helpers, the Levites, to make room for himself. Two things going on here. One, the Ammonite and the family are living in the temple against God's law. Number two, they've defiled the priests and the Levite. So Nehemiah shows back up. And he cleans out the room. He fumigates the place. He's, he's, he's extremely proactive and aggressive. He's not afraid to speak up. Listen. He's not afraid to speak up for the Lord. He's not afraid to step up. He's not afraid to take action. He's kind of like Jesus when you remember when he came into the temple that time and the money changers were there and they were ripping people off and he began to turn over tables and Jesus even took a, some cords that were there and he turned it into a whip. You guys remember that story? Meek and mild Jesus beating the heck out of the money changers? It's a story, Nehemiah, and a picture of dealing with compromise. The getting aggressive with it, with, with ungodly habits and, and, and practices and attitudes that will come back to take root in our life. See, let me have your attention. Listen, Nehemiah had established everything orderly according to the Lord and had done what God had asked him to do and set everything back in place. He had built the walls. The temple was functioning. He goes away and things begin to fall apart. People return to their old ways. You know, I, I grew up in the 60s. And when I was about 13 years old, not, not, I don't think it was her fault, but my mom went through a very difficult divorce. And it shook our family up. I mean, it, it was very difficult. And... Back then, it was kind of a big thing for your parents to divorce. And I have to say, even to this day, it impacted my life. Now, here in the 2000s, 2021, ah, divorce is no big deal. Look at the impact, though, it has on kids. Now, there's a lot of innocent parties, but I will say this, what was a huge deal in my youth has become no big deal in today's youth. In fact, you can hardly find a kid who would say, oh yeah, my, my parents are, have been married the whole time. When, when I was young, pornography was for perverts. You know what, statistically today, many in this room view it daily. The, the, the culture, if you're not careful, seeps into your heart, into your life. 
But back, back in the 60s, it just kind of started. People were living together. It was immoral. Alcohol and drugs. See, here, here's, the, here's the picture that Nehemiah brings forth into our day and our time. You and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And what do you allow into that temple? What's your Tobiah? That's the message here. What's the Tobiah that's creeped back into your life? You know, what, what, has, has, it, has it stopped the, the, the tithing in your life? Has it stopped the attending of the temple, going to services? Has it stopped you from serving or praying or sharing or being involved in what God's called? That's what happens here in Nehemiah. They drifted back to their old ways. They stopped keeping the commitments that they had made. And Tobiah is living in the temple. Now, I used to have a lot of things living in my life before I came to Christ. And today, when I look into that mirror, the flesh is still saying, hey, what about this? It's legal now. (laughs) (laughs) You're stressed. (laughs) But here's the thing. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Nehemiah chapter 13, let's go back there, come out of the fog. (laughs) Not only does he remove things, but look at verse 13, I appoint it as treasures, he he, he replaces it with something. I appoint as treasures over the storehouse, Shemeliah the priest and Zadok the scribe. And of the Levites, Badiah, and next to them was Hanan, the son of Zachar, the son of Matina. And for we considered faithful, and their task was to distribute to their brethren. He, 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 he places, takes, takes that Tobiah out, the compromise, the impurity, and he replaces it with a priest, a scribe, a Levite, a layman. And, and they all represent different areas of life for the people of Israel for your heart and mine, different things that that come into our life, spiritual, secular, whatever you want to call it. And then he mentions something about each of them that they all share in common. For they were considered, verse 13, faithful or trustworthy. And, And this is the call from Nehemiah. This is the call today for us is to be Faithful people who faithfully carry out the commitments that they made to the Lord. Remember when you first came to the Lord? Remember when you made a commitment recently? Remember when you said, Lord, this is not going to stay in my life anymore. Lord, I'm making this decision. I'm telling you this. This is what I'm going to do. I'm kicking Tobiah out. I'm going to be faithful to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, we have this passage of Scripture. Let a man so consider us, this is talking about those who are leaders, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. We're stewards of the gospel. We're stewards of ourselves. We're stewards of what God has placed in our life. And we're called to be, listen, faithful. Not because we get patted on the back, not because we get recognized at church, not because we get thanked publicly, not because we're so great. Here's the deal. We're just called to be faithful. You know what faithful means? It means you show up. You show up on time. Hey, I'm faithful. I'm here. You you do the work. You don't leave until the job is done. Day after day, you're faithful to, you honor Him with your lifestyle, with your resources, with your time. If there's anything God looks for in a person, are they faithful? Don't you like faithful people? Call somebody and say, yeah, I'll be there at such and such time and I'll do the job and I'll get it done. Isn't it amazing when faithful persons show up? I think God feels that way. I mean, that's a quality God looks for. In, in the parable of the talents in Matthew uh, 25, there, there's a verse that says, 
Then the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. There's something very powerful. And, this, and, and Nehemiah says, I'm just going to pick some people who are faithful. A, a real man, a real woman who, who loves the Lord, first and foremost, more than anything else, is just faithful to steward those things that he has given them. You know, I, I grew up in northwest Florida. This is my hometown. And, you know, you hear all kinds of things. And, and this, this is not to be at all in any way disrespectful. Or don't take this personal. But you always hear around northwest Florida, well, a real man is he hunts. Well, that's probably true. And they skin their own deer. A real man fishes. Okay. And he camps outside. A real man carries a weapon and has a tattoo. This might be so. A real man goes mudding. If you don't know what that is, Male man, real man has a four by four truck. Real man don't eat sushi. <laughs> a real man don't eat quiche. A real man don't have meaningful dialogue with nobody. <laughs> they own a chainsaw and drink Coors. That might be true in Northwest Florida or in other areas. But are you faithful? Do you serve? In Mark chapter 10, there, there's a wonderful passage that says, And it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great. Not all the things I mention, but shall be a servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. And then in verse 44, or maybe that's all there is. I think some of the things that we find in Nehemiah as we close out the chapter is that Tobiah has to leave and faithfulness has to come back. And that's true in all of our lives over and over again. Faithfulness, humility. Servant, R real men and women uh, who are the temple of the Holy Spirit are faithful, they serve, they're humble. And another thing I would point out, because he calls these men from different areas, is they know their gifting. Have you found out what yours is? Why not? Find out what your gifting is and your purpose and, and, and be used in the kingdom of God. You only got so much time for that to happen for you. And don't quit. Don't give up. Don't give a bunch of lame excuses. You know, the, the, your work, or whatever it is, is, is secular, spiritual, is ministry and worship to the Lord, and is always to be done with a grateful heart. A grateful heart. No matter how hard or difficult it gets, this is the story of Nehemiah. It was hard. It was difficult. Enemies came against him. You, you and I are, are a picture in many ways of that. Faithful, humble, he didn't quit, he served. I mean, listen to his prayer in verse 14 as we continue. He says, remember me, O my God, concerning this. Don't wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for its services. Well, here's what he's really saying, if I could summarize it. Search me, God, and know me. Know why I'm doing these things. Lord, Lord, help my life be that which is good for you. And this story, it goes on in those days, verse 15, I saw the people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath, bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, all kinds of burdens which they brought in Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. 
And I, I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. There was a strong, you know, deal about the Sabbath. Men of Tyre dwelt there also who brought the fish and goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and and Jerusalem. And, And I contended with the nobles of Judah. And I said to them, what evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath? Did not your fathers do thus and did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you bring added wrath and profaning this day. So it was at the gates of Jerusalem, as it began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded the gates to be shut. I charged that it must not be open till after the Sabbath. He's stopping the selling and buying. and all. Then I posted some of my servants at the gate, so no burdens would be brought in. Now on the merchants and the sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside of Jerusalem once or twice. Then I warned them. I said to them, why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do so again... I'll lay hands on you. And he's not talking about praying for him. (laughs) From that time on, they came no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves, and that they should go and guard the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Now, Now, let me have your attention. We'll talk a little bit about the Sabbath. People get hung up on this thing, the Sabbath. And, and some, some people get hung up on the day of Sabbath, which at that time was Saturday. Christians began celebrating the Sabbath, if you, if you want to call it that, on Sunday because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. They were Jews. Predominantly all Jews. And they didn't feel they were breaking the Sabbath, they were taking this Sabbath and redeeming it into a whole new thing because Jesus had risen on that day and they were celebrating the resurrection. And here's the thing. It's not so much about the day. It's about the heart and the principle of the Sabbath and why there's a Sabbath. The the reason for the Sabbath and the heart of the Sabbath is the issue, not the exact day of the Sabbath. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 11 For in the six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, the seventh day, and he hallowed it, and then he called his people to rest as well. Part of the principle of the Sabbath, and there's two of them, is a day of rest. You say, well, why would God rest? Was he stressed after all he had done? Was God tired? Was he out of energy? Was he exhausted? Was God at the end of that creation done? Man, you know, uh, I can't create another thing. This is is all I got. I don't have the juice for it. No. Here's the principle of the Sabbath. And, And some of you need to hear this. He was through creating. He was finished. And some of you need to learn how to stop once in a while. Take one day a week and rest. Turn it off. Turn off the phone, the computer. Stop working. Chill. Allow your body, mind, and spirit to be renewed. Rest. I'm not talking about every day, you lazy bum. (laughs) I'm talking about at least one day. Say, you know what? God is asking me to relax and recreate and recreate and allow everything to just kind of stop for a while. Because here's the thing, whether you believe it or not, you have limitations. And your body, your mind, your emotions need to stop and say, you know what? For this week, I'm through. It's done. That's one of the principles of the Sabbath. Physically. Now, the second one is in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commands that you keep the Sabbath day. Now, that principle is this, as you talk about the Sabbath. Israel did not deliver itself from Egypt. They were delivered out of Egypt by the almighty 
powerful hand of the one true God. And here's the thing spiritually. We're to remember that we can't save ourselves by our works, by our good deeds, by, by in any fashion, shape, or any direction we try, we can't save ourselves. And the rest that you're looking for here is to rest in His grace. You've been forgiven. Rest in His mercy. Rest in His love. You need to have a time when you focus on the fact that God loves me, He's forgiven me, and I can finally rest in the grace and the love and the mercy of God. I'm a new creation in Christ. There's two parts to the Sabbath. It's not so much about the day as it is about this principle of resting physically and realizing I've entered into the rest that comes with my salvation in Jesus Christ. Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem. And he finds that people have fallen away. They drifted from the Lord. And in verses 23, we pick it up in verse 20. In those days, I saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod. They could not even speak the language of Judah. They couldn't even speak their own tongue anymore. But spoke according to the language of other people. Another picture of mixing and unequally yoked. How powerful the job and the impact of a godly mother and father over your children. And here's the deal. What your children see you do, they will do. I don't care how much you talk to them, they know. Kids are smart. They play dumb, but they're smart. And they see everything, they hear everything, they know everything that you watch, that you bring into your home and into your life. And one day you say, why are they doing this? They learned it from you, for the most part. And this is the principle of Nehemiah. The, 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 the impurity that sneaks into the home, that sneaks into the life, that pretty soon you see it in the life of your children. Now, now it gets kind of, as we head into verse 25, it gets, well gets kind of hairy, no pun intended. I contended with them, I cursed them, I struck some of them, I pulled out their hair and made them swear by God, saying, you shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons as yourself. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him who beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused him to sin. Should we then hear of your doing all this great evil, transgressing against our God by marrying pagan? And the sons of Judah, the sons of Elishab, and the high priest was a son-in-law of Senballat the Horite. Therefore, I drove them from me. Pretty radical stuff. Can you imagine if you had compromise in your life? If you had impurity in your life? If you had allowed Tobiah to come back into your world and you began to practice things that you once practiced before you came to Christ and you came to church and the pastor grabbed you? He's ripping out your hair. I mean, this is some... This is some Uh, leadership 101 in the Old Testament, how to deal with congregants who have backslid. (laughs) I don't think it would fly much today. And there'd be a lot of more hairless people around here as well. It's once again equivalent to Jesus and and, the temple with the money changers. It's also a picture of Nehemiah and his great zeal and his great passion for God and his work and all that he had invested. The powerful passages about compromise and zeal for God closes this out in verse 29 where he says, Remember them, O my God, because they've defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood of the Levites. Thus I cleanse them of everything pagan 
And I assigned duties to the priests and the Levites, each to his service, and to bringing the wood offering and the first fruits at appointed times. And then he just says, Remember me, O oh my God, for good. The priestly office and the covenant of the Levites was a picture, a shadow really, of God's ministry of purification for you and I through our one day great high priest to come, Jesus Christ. That he would come, he wouldn't rip out our hair, but his hair would be ripped out. He would be crucified. He would be taken outside the city. His life would be given for you and I. And he would say to you, he would say to me, John, don't go back. Don't, don't, don't allow yourself when the enemy of the flesh continues to war against you to go back and let Tobiah back into your life. I, I, I see, I know, he's not gone away. And, and, and Luke chapter 4, we have that Great prayer of Jesus called the high priestly prayer. And then, then he tells us in this area, uh, not the prayer, but this is his, his call, the life of Jesus when he was getting ready to start his ministry. He said this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And that's what he's come to do for you and I, to take us out of our one-time darkness and into light, and then to establish us as faithful people, to call us to keep Tobiah out of our lives. You know, Today, you're here, I'm here, we're, we're, we're celebrating, we're hearing the Lord, we're worshiping his name. But perhaps you're here and you're saying, John, I've, I've allowed Tobiah back in. I have this vice in my life. I have this practice in my life. I have this issue in my life. I, 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 I've, I've, I'm very mixed. Well, the Lord would be saying to you, he'd be saying to me, I've come to cleanse. I've come to wash. I've come to renew. I love the passage of Scripture where it says, His mercies are new every morning. You can't save yourself, but He can. He can wash. He can cleanse. And as we've been talking about all through this passage and all through Nehemiah, He restores and He rebuilds. And He's calling you and I to be Faithful. Amen? Faithful. Be a faithful steward of what God's called you to be every day to the day you stand before him. And hopefully together we hear, hear those words, well done, good, and faithful servant.